you for joining us. Uh, thanks very much, Tom. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, George and I are going to be doing a double act this evening. Um, we're both going to introduce ourselves just briefly, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the Harper Adams sheep plucks um, and what's been happening there. And then George is going to continue to tell you about all the work we've been doing um, on um, worm resistance in the Slin breed. Um, and then we will obviously open everything up to, um, to questions. Um, and tell you a little bit about where we're going now and what we've been doing um, recently, more recently. So just to give you a little bit of background about myself, um, uh, Kate Phillips, I was born on a farm in Lancashire, which actually Lancashire is in the northwest of England. Um, and that was a dairy farm, but a very mixed farm when I was a child. Um, always had a love of livestock. Um, went off to university, did a couple of degrees, um, and then started working for a company called ADAS, which was basically an extension service really that was uh, post-war generated post-war but eventually when I was still working there it was a private consultancy company so I did that for 30 years as a nutritionist and a sheep specialist and then um, more latterly I, I went to work at Harper Adams. Um, I'm still a visiting lecturer at Harper Adams um, doing continuing work with the Schlin flock there um, but I also run my own small private consultancy business on sheep. So that's me. I'll give George uh, the floor now. George. Hi, uh, I'm George Callahan. Um, I'm a sheep farmer from Bath in Somerset in the southwest of England. Um, I grew up uh, here on the Tenanted Farm and I went to Newcastle University and then returned home. And after messing around with several different breeds of sheep, uh, we've been breeding pedigree clins now for about 12 years. And uh, I've been involved with various research projects with, with Kate and uh, with our uh, sheep group, which I'll talk a bit about in a moment. Okay, okay thanks. Oh, I forgot to say that I, I also have a small flock of Clin, pedigree Clint sheep as well. So just not quite as addicted as George, but I am, I am a breeder myself too. Okay, so just to tell you a little bit, sorry, just let's get this to move, I hope. Um, for some reason this is not moving on so bear with me a minute just to see yeah, if i no can um, don't know why it's not moving tom but oh, oh there we go so just to tell you a little bit about sheep at harper adams when i first went to harper adams they had um two flocks of sheep one was a suffolk which you've probably all heard of a suffolk cross mule flock which was really retained for doing research on feeding trials, trace elements, um, all sorts of different aspects of research and for teaching. Um, but also they had a pedigree Hlin flock, um, which was established in 2008. And this was actually used to be kept on a rented farm um, about 14 miles from the main university campus. Um, the flock has been signet, and you may be familiar with this, I'm not sure, but we have a performance recording organisation called Signet in the UK, um, and that means sort of collecting um, lots of phenotypic information on um, breeding sheep. And then our um, uh, Sam Boone, who is the leader of the Signet service, um, and Edinburgh in, e genes in Edinburgh actually create estimated breeding values for our pedigree sheep. So that's how they work. And, and Harper Adams has been doing that for the last um, 13, well, well, sort of about 10 years, I think, to be honest. Um, so all of the flock, the whole of the flock is uh, performance recorded. Um, there has been a recent rationalization of the flock down to, from a thousand ewes down to 720, because the um, flock has actually been moved from the tenanted farm up to the main campus farm where the flock is going to be integrated with the arable rotation which is something that's happening quite a lot in the UK now as um, you will probably all be hearing about sort of degradation of soils and how we need to look after our soils much better than we have in the past and an awful lot of farms are now taking on um, livestock to actually integrate, uh, get more organic matter into their soils to make them healthier for growing crops and to help manage things like black grass, which is actually a herbicide resistant weed that's quite a problem in the UK. 
Um, so what's happening at Harper, we're integrating this flock uh, into the arable rotation. Of course, on a university farm, we do have absolutely everything. So there's arable, dairy, beef, sheep, pigs and poultry. Um, but the arable um, will benefit, I think, significantly from having the sheep using new lays and forage crops across the arable rotation. Um, so recent research with the chins has included feed trials when resistant work with um, the group George is going to tell you about in a minute and um, an AHDB which is Agriculture, Horticulture and um, uh, Development Board um, which actually is paid for by a levy that the farmers pay in the UK on slaughtered animals um, and AHDB are sponsoring this particular project or they're running this project called Challenge Sheep, which I'll tell you a little bit more about now. Just a little bit of a mention, George, well, we might do a double act on this one. If I've missed anything, George, you must say. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Clin breed. Um, it's generally a medium sized ewe. We have ewes in the UK, anything from about 40 kilos for a typical sort of Welsh mountain up to sort of 100 kilo ewes for some of the heavy terminal sire type of breeds. Um, but this, this ewe sort of falls in the middle somewhere, I'd say somewhere between 60 and 80. Ideally, we'd like to, it to be about 65 kilos. Um, we see that as our most efficient ewe. It's white wooled and white faced, um, but a black nose is important. Um, we have white legs as well. Um, you can have black spots on the ears and my, the pictures I've shown you aren't showing any of the black spots, but they're allowed, but you aren't allowed any black spots on the legs or any brown hair in the legs either. So um, they're short, dense wool, so quite a tight fleece. Um, they're a polled breed, so there's no horns. And um, yes, that's about it. Anything to add, George, that you'd like to say? Um, only, only really to say that um, they were classified as a rare breed in sort of the late 70s, early 80s. And um, they've taken off in a big way um, in the last few years. I think as people have looked for a flock that they can have as a self-replacing breed rather than buying in in sheep and for their sort of relatively small size they've always been quite prolific so that's made them popular with uh, with sheep farmers uh, over the last few years that and um, it's taken from being a rare breed they've gone from about uh, just a couple of thousand to um, about 500,000 purebred ewes um, in the UK now and another 300,000 or so uh, crossbred uh, clean ewes. So um, they're about the fourth uh, most, most popular breed in, in the UK now. Yeah, um, and they do, take, like you said, George, they're quite prolific. They, they have had a, an, a reputation for having an awful lot of lambs and scanning at over 200%, but they've come down a little bit on that as people sort of aren't wanting lots of triplets. So um, we're probably um, rearing 150 to 200%, depending on the type of system they're being run on at the moment. Okay. Um, so just a little, little bit about the ADAS challenge, AHDB Challenge Sheep Project. Um, Harper Adams Clin Flock is working with another 10 commercial flocks across England. You can see on the map on the right of your screen, everybody, the numbers uh, are indicating where the farms are that are included in the project. And Harper Adams happens to be one of them. Um, we're tracking about 7,000 ewes over seven years. So it's a very long-term project. We've actually completed four years so far. Um, what the purpose of the project is, it's to look at the lifetime performance of ewes mated, mated for the first time as what we call ewe lambs at, in their first year of life, so seven to nine months old, or as what we call yearlings or shearlings, or an, we even have another word for them, thaves or um, gimmers. So there's a, the whole language of sheep production in, in the UK, which takes some getting used to depending on where you're living. Um, but so it's comparing ewes mated in their first year of life to ewes mated in their second year of life and how they perform long term, um, what the sort of culling rates are, um, what, what, what are the loss rates and why are these happening? Um, so the major focus for the farms involved is to look at body condition scoring. So we're doing that very regularly. We're weighing animals regularly and we're looking at the, both the ewes and the lambs in terms of health and growth. Um, and we're also trying to look at any management interventions to improve performance. All the flocks have been screened for what we call iceberg diseases. So we have some diseases that are sort of 
under the under the radar sort of if you know what I mean um, that are there but niggling um, diseases that are apparent on some farms but not on others and a lot comes down to biosecurity and not trying to not letting those come in when we're purchasing sheep. Um, so um, what the farmers are doing, they're collecting uh, data at five key times. So they're weighing and condition scoring ewes at topping, at scanning, and they're, they're not weighing ewes at lambing, but they are condition scoring them. They're weighing lambs at birth, and they're weighing lambs and ewes at eight weeks of age, and they're also weighing them at weaning. Um, and all of this data is um, amalgamated so that we're going to have seven years worth of data for the two cohorts of, sh of sheep going through. So in the first year, Harper Adams put in 315 yearlings and 65 ewe lambs. And then in the second year, we had about um, 30 yearlings and about 100 ewe lambs. So we're following those right through their seven years, if they last that long, of course. Um, so um, what are the key issues? These are the things we're looking at. The key issues with managing replacements, but maintaining growth as ewe lambs, what rate do they need to grow at to mate successfully? Um, how do we man manage body condition? Um, are we providing enough nutrition for growth and pregnancy? Um, and are we providing enough in lactation to make sure that these ewes don't lose too much weight or maybe um, run into problems with mastitis. We're also questioning whether it's appropriate on, on the farms to creep feed. What we call creep feed is giving lambs um, early access to concentrate feeds, compound feeds, um, at grass with their mothers or not, according to the age of the ewe, and um, what age are we weaning the lambs at? So that is varying amongst the farms from about 10 weeks of age to about 16 weeks of age. Um, so those are the things we're looking at. I can't share very many results with you at this stage because we're going to wait till we've got the whole seven years worth of data. So um, look out for that. Um, there are two camps in the UK in terms of lambing ewe lambs or yearlings. Some people definitely lamb ewe lambs and others definitely stick to um, yearlings because they prefer it and find ewe lambs um, too difficult to manage. So, um, but the results will be out before two, well, three years time, we'll get the full set of results. Okay, I think that's enough on challenge sheep. So I'll hand over to George now. Hi, so I'm, I'm uh, part of a group called Performance Recorded Clean Breeders and the uh, flock of Harper Adams is one of those flocks, but the rest of them are just uh, made up of uh, pedigree breeders, around 25 from around England and a few uh, in Scotland or with a, a similar sort of mindset of uh, being very committed to recording. And um, between us, we record about 10,000 uh, ewes uh, every year. And so that's about yeah, 17, 20,000 lambs. Uh, we were formed about eight years ago. And one of our uh, main areas we wanted to look at was uh, breeding sheep uh, to be resistant to the worms that uh, they get. Like you guys, we have issues with uh, the worms becoming resistant to, to the wormers that we're using, to the anthelmintics that we that we use. And uh, so we wanted to try and tackle it from the other end of uh, breeding uh, sheep that were themselves uh, resistant to the worms. Uh, so that we could uh, tackle the, the challenge in that way. So if I could have the next slide, Kate. So uh, lots of reasons why we wanted to look at this. Um, there have been uh, several estimates of how much is costing uh, the UK sheep industry but worm resistance at the moment. Uh, they've ranged from this one, which is on the low side, from around 3 million a year to some estimates have been near uh, 80 million a year. But we certainly know that we uh, it's costing us a lot already and we're kind of sleepwalking into a, a massive problem if uh, the wormers that we use uh, are ineffective anymore and we'll make um, uh, farming in, in some systems in the UK uh, untenable. Um, obviously, there's welfare issues as well. If, uh, if we're unable to, to get rid of these worms, uh, it could lead to obviously to diarrhea and eventual death. So we need to be uh, keeping an eye on it for those sorts of reasons. And um, more recently, environmental issues have come up. And there's an interesting recent study um, uh, in uh, the University in, in, in Scotland, um, SIUC there, who's shown that uh, Lambs infected uh, with parasites can uh, give a 30%, 33% uh, increase in uh, the methane yield and uh, 
that's just per kilogram of, of feed. So um, when you add that into the extended days to slaughter, you can see that it could be having a, a massive impact on the greenhouse gas emissions from, from the ship industry. And uh, we believe that breeders can have a, have a key role in, uh, in breeding these sheep that are genetically more resistant to the worms. Have the next slide, please, Kate. Sorry, it's just not moving on quick. Sorry, I don't okay. know why it doesn't do. <laughs> yeah, no, You'll okay. get there in a minute, George. Sorry. Yeah, I'll bear with you. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just one of those things. It's just yeah, no, it's been sitting there. for a minute. It doesn't seem to move on. So okay. Just, yeah. Let me. I don't know why. Yeah. Hmm. From memory, I think the next slide is talking there about. There we go. There we go. Why well, it's a big, yeah, big challenge for breeders. Um, so we do know that some of them are definitely genetically more resistant, but trying to identify those ones to then use them in breeding programs has been the hard bit. There's no direct measurement, so we can't actually look inside the stomach and intestines of these lambs um, without obviously slaughtering them, and obviously they're not great for in breeding programs once we've done that. So, so we need <laughs> some sort of uh, proxy measurement for doing that. Traditionally, we've done that by um, collecting individual faecal egg samples from it, uh, so that's just uh, collecting a, a sample of, of faeces from uh, individual lambs and then sending that off to the lab to have uh, the measurements done on how many worm eggs are, being, uh, are in each gram of faeces. Um, and as well as that, we've been looking at more recently the actual immune response itself, seeing if that could be used as an alternative phenotype. Both methods, though, are expensive and, uh, and require a huge uh, commitment from, from breeders. Yeah, we can flip to the next one if you like. Right. Um, so here's me doing some, uh, some faecal egg counts. Um, we use the information we get from that to give us uh, estimated breeding values. We have a separate one for strongars, which uh, worms give us a lot of problems in the autumn in the, in the UK, and uh, nemesodaris, which is uh, more of a problem for us in the early season. It can be difficult to sell it as, a, as an idea to breeders because to get meaningful results, um, you have to have quite a high worm challenge. And with that would be an associated check in production. We advise breeders to have a mob worm count of at least 500 um, eggs per gram and ideally near a thousand if we can do so that we can get a, a big enough range of results. And in some of the drier seasons, it can just be difficult um, to get those, uh, those counts up high enough anyway. If we do the next slide. So you can see what the difference we've been doing as a breed. Um, we've uh, really given it a go with this, tried to take as many samples as we can. And uh, compared to the other breeds in the UK, you can see that we were taking the vast majority uh, uh, of samples. We really wanted to give it a go uh, and seeing uh, what results we could get. Do the next slide, please, Kane. But if we come up against quite a few problems, or that, unfortunately, the more um, samples we took, the heritability is well, we'd hope that they would go up or gone down. So obviously heritability is important into how quickly we can make progress. And um, the heritability have always seemed to flip, flip around a lot. Some work that um, Kate and I did that we'll talk about a bit more in a minute showed that the repeatability of uh, taking these FEC samples isn't isn't great, so uh, we don't always get the same results from the same, same lambs. Lots of other potential issues as well about the amount of moisture content, particularly in um, very loose samples from, uh, from uh, individuals with, with very high worm count. So there's lots of places where errors can crop in in this, which, uh, which give us results that are harder to use for, for the breeding values. We do the next slide, King. So that's why we were uh, keen to look at um, an alternative way of doing it. And so rather than looking at what's coming out of the sheep at one end, we're looking at the actual immune response or the sort of the start of the process. Um, gets a bit technical, but uh, if you bear with us, yeah, I think hopefully you'll see where we're, we're coming from with this. So there's kind of two major mechanisms that control the, um, the worm resistance of individual sheep and two different immunoglobulins, which you call IgA and IgE. IgE controls the, um, the total number of worms, but um, it doesn't really work well as a, as a breeding objective because lambs with higher IgE um, levels actually have decreased growth, almost have um, to, uh, hypersensitivity kind of reaction to it and can have a, a nasty black scour. Whereas IgA um, controls the worm size and it can actually be quite a, a useful measure if we 
do the next uh, animation, please, Kate. Um, it targets um, the immune cells for the worms to grow. Um, it's not exactly exactly understood how it does, but it gives a sort of more slippery surface to, to the stomach that makes it harder for the worms to attach properly and they can't feed so well. We'll do the next one, okay? Um, that then leads to shorter worms and uh, those worms that are shorter then produce fewer eggs. And the eggs that they do produce are less viable, they're less, less fertile themselves, so it sets up a nice sort of virtuous uh, circle. Uh, and there's a test that we can use to actually target the, the main worm that gives us problems in the autumn, which is uh, in this country, Telodosagia circumcincta, and we can actually pick up the IgA response to that spe uh, specific worm. And um, research had suggested that using this method we uh, may be able to make progress quicker than, uh, than by doing the faecal egg samples. Um, again yeah, we can't measure the IgA directly um, uh, in the uh, intestines of the sheep but you can pick up the a proxy measurement in both uh, saliva and serum of the sheep. The next slide okay. So um, this is collecting um, saliva IJ samples and um, just uh, putting a dental swab into a lamb's mouth and whizzing it around and sending off the individual ones for analysis. Um, we start with this because it's a fairly easy method of collecting them that farmers could do themselves. Um, and we took, we've taken uh, over the years uh, over 8,000 samples of this. Unfortunately, the more we looked at it, um, heritability was not as, uh, as high as we had hoped. We've been working with researchers at, at Glasgow University. Their initial research had suggested uh, heritability should be quite high, but unfortunately it, it fell again. Unfortunately, the more we did it, again, there are various areas where um, errors could, uh, could come in. We're about whether we should be fasting or not fasting the lambs before they came in and the dilution rates of the saliva. So, we're still interested in this, but we wanted to try and look um, with, uh, unfortunately, the researchers we've been working with at Glasgow left and uh, we weren't quite sure where to take it. So we as a group then went back and had a look at the initial research that people had done. You don't need to worry too much about uh, the specifics of this, but what we found, as I've highlighted in, in, uh, in red here, that most of this initial research was done using plasma from, from blood rather than from, uh, from saliva. We do the next one, Kate. Um, and this is just showing the same again, more research showing that uh, to actually to get a better indication of what was happening in the stomach, maybe uh, blood would, would be a, a better uh, method of looking at that. And, um, and the next slide just shows this confirmed again in uh, similar research uh, using blood serum here in, um, in Spanish research uh, using their sheep there. So everything seems to point us in the direction that maybe if we wanted to get a handle on this IGA that uh, that maybe we should be looking at, at blood rather than, um, than saliva. So that's why we uh, came up with the idea for this big project at Harper Arms, we called the Harper Project, trying to find um, which actually was the, was the best method for this. So looking at all the, the different options that we had. And uh, this was a project run, uh, run by Kate uh, at Harper, as well as the, our individual uh, farmers uh, providing lots of samples. So if Kate wants to take it on from here, she can uh, go into the more specifics of, of that that project there. Okay, thanks, George. Um, yes, we were lucky. Well, uh, Sam Boone in um, Signet has been incredibly encouraging throughout all of this work and has really supported us and subsidised um, some of our testing. And he, um, uh, together with the team at PRLB and uh, Harper Adams, got together to put a proposal in <coughs> to get funding from what we call the European Innovation Partnership, which so we got actually a sensible amount of funding. It's quite hard to come by sometimes and we keep trying, but not always succeeding. Um, but we managed to get this. And of course, then we set up some trial work at Harper Adams. So as George has mentioned to you, um, we uh, done a lot of FECs in the past, fig leg counts, and um, the group had also done a lot of um, saliva samples too and we just thought it would probably be worth looking at serum so um we done we did a first year of work looking at the repeatability of the testing um 
the first look see in the first year, do you remember, George? We did about 200 ewe lambs and we looked at the repeatability. And then we thought, actually, we need to look at this again. So we set up quite an intensive testing period for 84 lambs. We were looking at repeatability on the same day for FEC saliva and serum um, and we were looking at repeatability over a period of time so we actually took the trial we looked for a total of 38 days from the start of the trial to the end and we were really hoping to look at the robustness of the estimated breeding values that we've been working out um, trying to think what would be the most cost effective testing program because fecal egg counting is is laborious, messy, as you can imagine, and taking individual fecal samples from the anus of a lamb is not, it's not preferable, you know, it's not the one you'd choose to do if you had the choice. So a serum uh, blood sample or a saliva test, um, much more appealing to most of us. Um, and as George intimated, um, we weren't absolutely sure about how we should be taking the tests. Um, you know, in terms of food, water, that sort of thing. Um, and we were concerned that as a group of farmers, were we all doing it exactly the same? So we tried to be very routine about this at Harper Adams. Um, and we were hoping to come out with just one test, which would make it all so much simpler for everybody. Um, so, um, yeah, just we basically four years of sampling by PRLLB for saliva IGA. Um, and the first year at Harper Adams, we looked at two consecutive days for testing for FEC and saliva IGA, but they didn't agree very well on two consecutive days. So that made us move on to the next trial. So um, the trial um, was put together in 2018 and we actually had some planned matings of um, uh, use with particular rams. So we chose rams that had high or low EBVs for faecal egg count or for IgA. And then we bred those lambs and then we used those lambs in the trial. So we had 10 new lambs and four weather lambs from each of the six sires that we used. So it's one ram to 50 ewes, single sire mating, and then we looked at a selection of the lambs born to those sires. The average age of the lambs on the trial was seven months. So it was a 38 day period for all the samples I've mentioned. Um, we had a few students working with us on this work as well. So we had some university students doing their final honours research project with us, which was really helpful um, in terms of sampling and, and time involved and statistical analysis and things. So what we were trying to see was how IgA um, in serum and saliva actually changed over time and was that going to be the best way um, to look at worm resistance in our sheep. So um, yep yeah, I've already said that haven't I? Yes right just on just in October 2018 we did duplicate FEC and saliva samples on day one and a single serum sample on day one. Um, we actually because we we're concerned about FEC not being particularly accurate on an individual basis. We as a nation in the UK use it as a mob sampling to, to decide whether we're going to worm animals or not. But um, as an individual um, measure, we're not actually convinced that that's ideal. Um, so what we actually did as well, we actually took the 12 weather lambs and we slaughtered them on day two and we slaughtered another 12 um, later in the trial. Um, so that we could actually count the number of worms within the gut and speciate the, the worms as well. So we knew what was actually there. So, um, so basically we repeated the sampling over the next 36 days with three FEC samples, five saliva and three serum samples. So not surprisingly, we found some variation in the faecal egg count results and very wide variation compared to the initial mob count. So we would have some lambs with zero counts and some with over a thousand. So, um, but the overall average was quite low. It was one of those seasons which is quite dry and we didn't get a particularly high mob count, but we did have lambs within the group that would have been considered um, clinically diseased. Um, a possible reason for some of the low counts, some of the faeces samples were quite liquid, so um, it's very hard, as you can imagine, to take a good sample of a wet sample. Um, so, you know, there are issues in the analysis of those liquid samples. Um, the lab also that we were using at the time um, considered that 
a difference of 180 eggs per gram was um, an acceptable variation between duplicate samples, which we were quite surprised about at the time when we were told that because we saw quite a big difference from the first sample taken to the second one on the same day. Um, but when we were told 180 eggs per gram was a sort of sensible error, um, then um, it, things looked a little bit different. But um, it, it really did worry us that wide range, thinking about what that meant in terms of an individual lab. We were relying on one faecal egg count to, to as, be as a measure for its um, uh, you know, estimated breeding value. So that's why we're sort of moving away from the FEC. Um, so the results show that 75% of the results from duplicate samples were within the, within the accepted limit of 180, but an awful lot, 25% weren't, which was quite concerning to us in terms of selecting the superior animals. So just this is a major sort of summary of where we ended up. I've not given you all, all the details of, of the work we did, but um, what the important thing from um, any of this analysis is we rank animals correctly so that the best lamb is always the best lamb and the worst one is always the best at uh, the worst one. So um, in terms of the analysis that we did, we did a, science, a statistical test called the Spearman's rank correlation, which basically tells us how likely it is that the best lamb is going to be always the best and the worst is going to be the worst. So if you look at the, the column in the middle, a Spearman's rank correlation coefficient, the closer that is to one, the better the agreement, okay? So the better the ranking of the animals. So they're coming back in largely the same order, whatever test you do. So you can see on the faecal egg count on day one duplicates, it's sort of middling. It's not a particularly brilliant correlation. They say the closer to one we are, the better it is. So that's suggesting there's some variation with some lambs changing order in the ranking. And likewise, it was a little bit better for saliva, but not a huge amount better. Um, and if you just look down, you will see the best agreements we were getting in terms of the ranking of individuals was with the serum IgA, the blood sampling not the saliva, which George pointed out, the sort of variations we might be getting in flow of saliva, be it the animal wasn't, hadn't eaten for a few hours or hadn't drunk anything for a few hours or potentially was stressed. So um, we are feeling much more confident that serum IgA is going to give us a reliable estimate of worm resistance um, or a better, a more reliable um, method than either faecal egg counting or saliva IgA. You can see those nice high correlation coefficients, um, you know, being really promising. That's where we want to see the correlations. So the other thing we did, and this was a little bit unnerving, um, we slaughtered those um, uh, weather lambs. Um, and on the right hand side of the table, you can see we've got the mean faecal egg count. And as I said to you earlier, none of the counts were particularly high, um, but some of these lambs were quite loose. But you can see on the left hand, um, uh, the ab abomasum teledosagia, you can see we've got some incredibly high counts there of, of um, teledosagia in the gut. So the faecal egg count wasn't telling us an awful lot about what was actually happening in the animal because at the level of 13,900 or 15,400, um, that animal would have been clinically affected by those worms in its gut. So the faecal egg count was suggesting maybe that the adult teledarsaja weren't actually laying eggs yet um, and they weren't coming through in the feces. So um, we've always, I, I've always been interested to see a particular slide that um, a, a colleague of mine would use. And she would always say that um, you don't see a drop in performance. Um, you, you don't see it until it's too late almost. So weighing and measuring animals to detect the impact that the worms are having is a far better thing than thinking, well, I'll wait till to see if they've got a dirty backside, um, because this one is quite a good indicator to show that there's a lot of worms in that animal, but the faecal egg count wasn't telling us that. So the results um, clear, there was a heavy infestation with adult and immature L4 T in some lambs. Um, 
but we, as I've said here, the worms were not laying eggs or some of the feces was liquid, so can't, uh, the counts were artificially low. So overall, um, what we found quite promising was that um, these are the six sires of the lambs that we had in that particular trial. And the um, green bar is the saliva IgA and the blue bar is the serum um, IgA. And there was a trend to show that the, the rams that had um, a high um, EBVs for FEC and saliva IgA were actually trending towards a significant difference in um, IgA within the lambs. So that was really encouraging that that was going to, you know, it was coming through, the heritability was coming through with a serum IgA and potentially a lot better than we'd had for um, saliva or fecal egg counts. So our project conclusions, repeatability of duplicate samples on the same day for FEC and saliva, very variable and what we consider pretty unreliable. Um, the ranking of individuals by FEC and saliva showed some consistency, but it wasn't brilliant, but the serum was much more um, consistent. So we're much more positive about that. Um, and now we're thinking that that is where we're going forward um, using the serum IgA. And George will now probably tell you a little bit more about what we've done since we finished the work at Harper Adams. Um, yeah. Okay, George, over to you. Great, thanks. So uh, I'm with this knowledge that uh, serum was looking uh, a really good possibility. Uh, um, HDB, our uh, levy board, funded uh, last year to take uh, another 3,000 uh, blood samples. We actually were joined in this work by um, a different breed as well, um, the Ixlanas, who are a composite breed um, who are wool shedders. So to be honest, they're actually quite similar to the kids. But, uh, but they shed their own wool. They've become uh, very popular over the last few years. And um, they have also been involved uh, in, in uh, worm resistance uh, work in the past as well. So it's good uh, that they, they joined with us. And what was, was great that they took enough samples so we could analyze uh, their breed and our breed separately. And uh, what's the great result is the, is the uh, really, really high heritabilities that both uh, um, populations uh, achieved uh, when we analysed the results. So these heritabilities of 39% uh, and 36% are way higher than uh, any other indicators we've looked at for worm resistance in the past and uh, are on a, a par with uh, the carcass traits, which, uh, which was really pleasing to see. Um, the Xlanda ones, rather frustratingly, uh, were correlated nicely with their fetal egg counts, but it'd be just nice, to, which is nice to see it was working in the same way. Well, certainly ours weren't quite so well correlated, but uh, but I think, uh, as you can see, uh, we've pointed out all the uh, the errors we found in, in the FEC testing. So I think uh, we're not overly concerned about that, but uh, it was just uh, great to, to see this sort of a result uh, that we actually are finding on farm rather than just in, in a, a research setting uh, over several different farms. And uh, when you combine the two results, we were, we're getting a heritability of, of over 30%, which is fantastic, which means uh, in theory, we should be able to use this as an indicator in which we can make progress uh, really quite quickly. And uh, then we've taken another uh, 4,000 or so samples again, again this year. And uh, we'll have a, a published estimated breeding value for it uh, with uh, the other things we, we get published uh, via our, our recording service uh, next year so that uh, we'll be able to sell that rams from uh, people that have a, a known estimated breeding value for, uh, for this uh, serum IGA. Do next slide, King. There's a slide being. Oh, here we go. Um, this is just to give you an indication of sort of range that we're finding uh, with these samples. So we seem to tend to get a few, uh, few very high reactors, um, which we, if we can identify and we can use uh, in the uh, in the breeding programs, can show that hopefully we can make that quick progress. Still a few questions we have. It looks like maybe the um, September. Uh, time is probably the best time for sampling them as we're uh, getting a, a nicer, bigger variation during that sort of time. Um, um, probably a, a higher challenge at that time of year. And just uh, to big myself off a bit, my own flock is the one in the light green here. And uh, so it's pleasing to see that I had the, the highest uh, account of, uh, of any of the sheep tested. Um, if you could just do the next slide. And here we just, uh, this is three of my rams and uh, 
quite nice to see here where the, the progeny from those lambs from a, a high and average and a, and a bottom on the EBV it's actually being born out in, in their progeny being born as well where they're um, showing uh, that uh, the differences between those rams uh, is being reflected in the uh, in performance of their lambs. Do the next slide Kate uh, I think you just might need to do it one more time. Great so um, it's where we go from here now so us again with those uh, Exana breeders we um, think that we've, we've come up with a tool that could be, be really helpful. From here we just need to carry on and uh, to hopefully test a lot more sheep. Ideally we'd be taking tissue samples from them as well as so hopefully we might be working towards uh, genomics and um, we're not quite there yet in the UK with that but hopefully uh, if we can collect enough samples from uh, from tested sheep we might be able to uh, identify uh, markers uh, associated with worm resistance that way. Um, just need to check using the right protocols, um, mainly testing the right time of year with the IGA um, and uh, it'd be interesting if we could, I thought we were going to do it as part of the Harper project to follow these lambs that we're testing through to when they're breeding females to see um, how that affects the, the periparturian rise when they land themselves. But unfortunately, because of COVID, we couldn't do that as part of the Harper project, but it'd be good if we could have a look at that in the future. And um, it'd be great if uh, once we've identified some sort of divergent lines, if we could do a bit more of that uh, dissection work uh, and just check that uh, we're on the right track there. It would uh, just give us a bit more confidence, although we, we are, are growing in confidence about it now. Um, there's also a bit of work generally I've seen in Australia lately where they've been um, using uh, immunity responses to, to vaccines to identify a more sort of general health uh, uh, EBV and I think that there might be the, the scope for doing that with the, the sort of work we're doing here as well. And uh, as we become more confident about these, these rams, we, uh, we need to develop a, um, a better uh, marketing strategy for them. Something I think we also need to remember is we're, we're very uh, reliant at the moment, although universities were doing it, we now have a commercial lab that, that's doing it for us. And uh, it's, uh, that relationship has been, been great with us and they've, they've helped uh, develop the test with us. And uh, it's essential that we, we have a lab like that that's going to analyze the results, otherwise, uh, uh, we're, we're a bit stuck, so we just realised the importance of that, that relationship. i do the next slide. So just to, to conclude this bit really, um, you say that we've, we've come a long way, um, but it's only thanks to the, to the enthusiastic breeders that we've been working with and uh, backed up with uh, support from our levy board. I'm sure we've shown you it's quite complicated, but I really feel like we've made a, a massive amount of progress now with this um, uh, so serum IGA, I think we've got the tool that we, we really needed. Been a bit frustrating because the other countries have found fecal egg sampling to be much more successful. Australia and New Zealand have been able to get quite high heritability with it, but for some reason we, we've never been able to, to replicate that in the UK. But I think now we, we've got a tool that we can use. But um, we're just going to need support from the industry if we're going to get carry on to, to do this sort of work. And um, the last thing I just need to do is thank uh, everybody that we've been working with, various breeds and um, universities and, and funding bodies that have, that have helped us get this far. Thanks a lot.